Welcome everyone. You are joining us for Quantum Efficiency Measurements, Fundamentals for Solar Cell Research, Part 2. This webinar is presented by MKS Newport and hosted by Photonics Media. Today you're going to hear from Ken Corelli, Dave Sobranis, and Todd McFarland from MKS Newport. Ken is a Product Marketing Specialist. Dave is an Applications Engineer and leads the Product Specialization and Customization Program. And Todd is a Lead Development Engineer for the company. You are welcome to ask any questions or leave comments in the chat box at any time. If you have any technical issues during this event, please log out and back in to rejoin. You will be able to access a recording of this webinar online after the event, and you will receive a link to that recording by email. So with nothing further from me, I'd like to first welcome Ken Corelli. Welcome. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. As Joanna mentioned, I'm Ken Corelli, the product specialist for MKS Newport. Uh, Dave Sobranis is our Applications Engineer for Specials, uh, and Todd McFarlane is our Lead Electronics Engineer for our MKS Newport products. I want to thank all those who are returning from part one of our webinar, as well as those new for this part two of a two-part series. Um, today, for this series of part two, we're going to go over the EQE and IQE test methods, as well as the detailed equipment overview for those different applications and modes of testing. We're gonna go over some specific device under test interfacing that you'll need to be aware of, as well as add into additional testing with IV curve testing to further characterize your device under test. We're also gonna go over other testing such as temperature and UV exposure to your cell or other device, as well as take some time to go over an MKS Newport quantum efficiency spotlight system. Yeah, again, those who have not seen part one, again, here's a quick review of what we covered in part one to get some basic fundamental understandings of quantum efficiency and cell design. Um, I would encourage those who are new to this uh, webinar part two to review this on either photonics.com or on our MKS Newport web uh, YouTube page to review the information covered in that part one webinar. And with that, I will hand it over to Dave Sobranis. Thank you, Ken. So what we'll start off with here, uh, this is uh, basically we left off with IQE and EQE testing on our first uh, webinar. So just as a quick recap, I'll start off with the EQE testing. And so basically what we wanna look at is the amount of light that's coming into your device under test. And in this particular case, since we're doing the external quantum efficiency, we're not going to measure the amount of uh, light or photons that are being reflected from that surface. So what we're concerned with here is the number of photons coming into your device under test and the number of electrons that are being produced. And we measure that and that ratio will give us a percentage and therefore give you the efficiency of uh, your device under test. And as we go along, you'll see that that can be done at very specific wavelengths and you can scan the uh, wavelengths of interest for your device on test doing that. <clears throat> so this is uh, something that you might have in your lab already, many of these components. So uh, what I'm gonna do is just, I'll go through this on a quick overview on the, the top level here, and then we'll get into each of the items as we go further into this webinar. But we'd have a, you would start with a broadband light source, which could go through a, an optical filter system. Um, you can then use a monochromator to take that light and split that light up into individual wavelengths. Those can then go through a chopper. That light can then come through onto your device under test, which is mounted to a chuck. The chuck can be temperature controlled. Uh, you can then measure current and voltage. And uh, you can also use um, an input light detector to calibrate your system. So this is just a, a 30,000 a foot view of what you could do to set up a system that would allow you to do an EQE measurement. And uh, as we progress now, we'll get into each of these uh, components in more detail. So we go to the next slide, Ken. So I've just labeled everything A through F. And if we start off with the uh, broadband light source, so uh, letter A, upper right uh, hand corner, are photos of the two styles of uh, broadband light sources that are common that we uh, sell and use. Uh, one of them is an arc source. So a xenon or, a Z or mercury xenon arc lamp, which can provide a very large amount of energy 
Um, it does have emission lines and uh, I'll call it spikiness in the spectrum. So you have to account for that. There is another style that we use, which is a, a, a quartz tungsten halogen lamp that gives a much smoother output, but it's also a, a much less power powerful source. <clears throat> Either of these sources works well. The, the light then coming through or coming out of the, the light housing will go through a collimating style of lens and then that light will go through a filter system. And in this case, it's a filter wheel. This filter wheel assembly that we sell at Newport is, uh, th there are six positions and you can use those uh, different, uh, I'll, I'll call them uh, cut on filters that will allow you to pass the uh, wavelengths that you're interested in as you're doing your scan, but also block the lower wavelengths to then block harmonics that may come into your um, uh, your higher order uh, wavelengths that you're looking at. So those are the first two components that make up this system of what we call a TLS, so a tunable light source. And uh, on the next slide, we'll get into um, C and D. So now that you have your light coming from your broadband light source through the filter system, you're gonna come into a monochromator. This is what we use to then take that broadband light source and break that light source up into the, I'll call it the color of the rainbow, <clears throat> by using a grating. And this grating then will break that light up. And depending again on the wavelengths of interest, you will have different gratings that you can select for the monochromator. In this particular case, this type of a monochromator has the ability to have two gratings in it. So that when you, uh, when you go through the range of your first grating, you can then rotate the other grading into position to carry you further out into the near IR. So there again, depending on the wavelengths of interest, uh, typically it'd probably be in the 300, 350 nanometers up to potentially 1800 nanometers. <clears throat> you can then use and select the gratings that are most appropriate for your uh, testing. This then allows the broadband light source to come in. It's broken up into the colors of the rainbow and then by very carefully moving the grating, you can move the rainbow uh, essentially uh, behind a slit. And that slit will then allow a very narrow band of light to come through, and thereby you can get your monochromatic light by uh, adjusting the slit width and by using a proper grating that, that uh, matches the uh, wavelengths of interest that you're gonna be using for testing. So once that's done, you now have monochromatic light coming out of your monochromator. Another thing that you can use, this also helps for uh, uh, being able to detect very small signals, is you can use a chopper. So this chopper is controlled. Uh, the the uh, wheel of the chopper can have two, one, many different uh, slots in the, in the wheel itself and we control the motor speed so that we basically control the frequency of that chopped light coming through. So if we go to the next slide. So now that we have monochromatic light and it's chopped, um, now we can use that light to actually do something with it. And in this case, to do a, an EQE measurement. So I will um, look at, uh, I'll show, point you to picture F on the top there. What you have or what we set up is a linear slide, a linear positioning system where you can orient your detector and your device under test onto that slide. And one of the key things about this is that the light output from your uh, uh, tunable light source is shining onto your detector in a way that does not overfill the detector and that the surface face of that detector is um, at the same planar distance as the device under test will be. So that when you take one out and slide the other one in, the light energy coming to both of those has the same energy density uh, and distance from your uh, optical output. Um, the options that you have are, there are many different options in, in terms of holding your device under test. That would be the letter E. So the, system you see there has concentric rings. Those concentric rings can be hooked up to vacuum ports and the uh, device under test can be held down by a gentle suction. The um, <clears throat> plate that it's mounted on can be 
cooled or heated, so you can control the temperature of your device under test as well. There are also uh, several different styles of probes that can come in and make very accurate contact for your electrical connection. The other component that is uh, shown here on the bottom left is a lock-in digital amplifier, and that will work with the signal that's coming in, this chop signal, so that the detector is uh, getting a, a chop signal, which is then going to create an output that has a certain frequency to it that the digital lock-in amplifier will then lock into, and in that way, you can filter out all the other uh, noise in the system. If you can go to the next slide, Ken. So we just talked about the chopped light and combining that with a digital lock-in amplifier. And the reason you want to use a, a, a system like this is that you would have really much better noise reduction. So you can detect really small signals uh, amongst, let's say, a noisy environment. And the noisy environment could be just the office lights or the lab lights that are shining on your device under test. Um, but by using this uh, digital lock-in amplifier, <clears throat> you can still get a very accurate uh, signal that you can use uh, as your output. Um, so another benefit is that this your device under test will not need to be put into a, uh, a let's say, a light-tight enclosure. Um, because of that digital lock-in amplifier. Um, this is also something that is <clears throat> really a requirement if you're going to do any kind of multi-junction testing. Um, the light bias, which is normally used for that type of application, would require you to then use uh, a, a chop signal so that you can actually see the signal amongst the uh, light bias that you're shining on your device under test. A drawback could be that if you have a slow device, a slow device under test, and that those res response times, um, uh, let's say it doesn't ramp up fast enough when you're using a chop signal, then you may have to then go to a DC style of measurement. And um, on the DC side of things, the DC methodology is obviously much less expensive. You don't need all of this equipment. Um, the DC signal processing, again, less expensive. It cannot be used if you're going to use a light bias um, uh, lighting situation for your device under test. There will be a higher noise with the signal, and there may be a time when you need to actually enclose this in a light tight enclosure. It is uh, the lowest cost, though, of both of these methods. We can go to the next slide, Ken. So we talked about the ambient light considerations and light tight boxes. Um, one of our systems we call a Quantex, which you see on the on the right hand side. <clears throat> one of the options is a uh, light tight enclosure that hinges up so that you can put your device uh, that you're going to test onto that uh, platform, which can be cooled. It's got tilt tilt uh, capability, and then you can completely uh, make that light tight so that you can make the uh, the signal on that a very clean signal. And so uh, that would be a very good system for a DC style of measurement. You can also use uh, light tight enclosures that we sell where you could put your instrumentation uh, completely within the box, such as we're showing on the left, or even maybe have a port that uh, the light shines through that port into your device under test. Go to the next slide, Ken. We also talked a little bit about the way in which you can hold your device under test. So. I mentioned earlier that the concentric rings, which you can see on the upper right, they're in colors, purple, red, and green. <clears throat> Depending on the size of your device, you can use the vacuum ports to hold it down to that plate. The plate also has a water cooling capability, so you can circulate cold or hot water or, or even room temperature water, depending on the temperature you want to hold it at. We also have lots of uh, uh, probe setups that can be used this particular one I show sort of in the middle of this slide, this uh, bracket actually bolts directly to the um, the vacuum chuck that's, that holds it down. And then you can position these probes to make uh, electrical contact to your device. Some of the other pictures we show, um, one of our labs uses um, some rear contact uh, methods. And it's kind of the picture, the second one on the bottom left where we can make back contact to the, the device under test and the other side has a bored hole through the um, metal that supports it 
so that the light can come down <clears throat> and shine on that front surface and you can still make contact, electrical contact to the backside. So we can go to the next slide. So along with all of the hardware we've been mentioning, uh, really a, a key piece of uh, component that you really need is very good software. Um, one of the packages that we sell, we call it TrackQ Basic. The TrackQ Basic software is, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, handy piece of uh, software. It allows you to do a lot of things. You can measure power, voltage, current, and you can compare that to the wavelength. So the scan that you see on the bottom left is a scan of voltage versus, let's say, uh, wavelength out to 1100 nanometers. <clears throat> the software lets you uh, pick the wavelengths of interest. It lets you pick your incremental change in terms of how, how many wavelengths uh, distance do we want to move between each sample test, uh, test point. Um, it gives you the ability to export this data. You can save it and export it into, let's say, Excel, and then you can process that. <clears throat> and then also, the software allows you to do an EQE. And it also has the ability, especially if you're using a DC uh, type of um, testing, to subtract background uh, signals or background noise. And we can go to the next slide. So this would be the method in which you would do an EQE test. So the software helps you and the software uh, will prompt you and you can select the different things required to do an EQE test. So in this particular example, uh, the first thing it's going to ask is that you would load a reference detector calibration file. So you can see the picture on the upper right. It's uh, it's all there and you would just click on load and you would load in that reference detector calibration file, which is something you would get if you were to buy a uh, reference uh, detector from Newport. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, the detector and the device under test have to have the same planar distance from your uh, your output light coming from the TLS in this case. You can see that on the bottom right picture is that, that rail I mentioned earlier and that these components are set up very specifically so that when you slide one out of the way and slide the next one in, the light energy is the same density and the same focal point, uh, whether it's on the detector or on your device under test. Um, you would then be prompted to open up the shutter and you would perform a scan. And it, when you do this scan, the scan would be saved. I put here ABC, but you can name it anything you want. You just have to remember what you called it. And that would be your reference scan. So that's what you would do first using the reference detector. The software would then continue to prompt you. So you would remove the detector. You would position your device under test into that beam path. Very important uh, piece of information here is that you have to be very careful to align the beam output so that it is between your bus bars. If the light is hitting your bus bars, some of that light then is reflected and that will not then show, that will be a lost energy and you'll get a, an EQE that's lower than it actually is. So that needs to be adjusted very carefully. The software prompts you again to load your reference scan, which you would then load in, which you previously saved, as we said before. And then you can select perform the QE scan. The system will then perform the scan for you. And then the uh, scan that you get, which is in the bottom left uh, picture here, shows you what that EQE scan would look like depending on uh, how efficient your device under test is. OK, we can go to the next slide. OK, so this is a just a. A quick overview, we started off with um, a broadband light source. It goes through a filtering system. The filtering system then allows that light to go into, in this case, a monochromator. The monochromator can break that light up into its individual wavelengths. You can then get monochromatic light coming out. That monochromatic light will go through then a chopping system. And that chopper, uh, in combination with a digital lock and amplifier, will then give you the ability to, to uh, get very low signals with very low noise. And then you can do an EQE test as we just described <clears throat> using a, your device under test uh, mounted to a chuck and uh, using a, a, a detector for your calibration uh, files. 
And that's an overview of then EQE testing. All right, so we're gonna do a poll now. I'm gonna launch that and you should see it show up on your screen. The question is, which wavelength range of interest best describes your device under test requirements? The first option is standard 300 to 1100 nanometers, extended 300 to 1800 nanometers, or you have standard plus UV, including less than 300 nanometers, then extended plus IR, including greater than 1800 nanometers, or all of the above. So I'll give you a few more moments to answer that. See your results pulling in. All right, and get your last answers in and then I'll close it. All right, so let me share these results. So it looks like 24% said standard, 33 said extended, 10% said standard plus UV, 10% said extended plus IR, and 24% said all of the above. So thank you, everybody, and I'll hide that and hand it back to you guys. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks, Ken. Okay, I mentioned earlier when we started the webinar that we had both EQE and IQE uh, testing, and in this particular case, we'll do a quick, quick review of the IQE testing. I mentioned earlier from our previous uh, webinar that the EQE was not measuring the reflected uh, photons coming to your device under test. And now we're going into the IQE testing and the IQE testing, we will be measuring those reflected photons. That's an important piece to capture the energy that's not being absorbed by your device under test. Um, this way uh, we would then have an accurate uh, efficiency of the device itself knowing how much of that energy had been reflected. So it's basically the same ratio, the number of photons coming in minus the amount that we've captured on the reflection and then versus the amount of uh, electrons that you're producing. So we've already talked about being able to create monochromatic light, so I, I won't re-review re that. Um, in this case though, when the light is exiting the chopper and coming to your device under test, the device under test would be a, a, held at a small angle so that uh, a specular component of that reflected energy coming off your uh, device under test would be captured by a, reflective, uh, a reflection detector. And that detector then is gonna monitor uh, the, the uh, reflected photons so that we can use that uh, component to subtract that from the light coming uh, to your device under test and then account for that loss so that you can create a more accurate, uh, let's say IQE um, scan of your device under test. And in this case, one of the things that we use when we're doing this uh, uh, setup is we use a high reflection and a low, ref low reflection standard. <clears throat> These give us a, a low point and a high point to effectively uh, create a, a calibration of our system so that we, uh, we can then know where we are in terms of the detector that we've got that we're using. And um, the software is a big component again that uses that information to, uh, to uh, subtract that from your light signal coming to your device under test. So we can go to the next slide. So there are um, times when you may have a device under test that, may, that might have a significant component of diffuse reflection. What I had shown to you previously was a specular reflection. So if you had a surface that was a mostly specular reflective type of device under test, the previous system would have worked well. However, if you've got a surface that is, let's say a roughened surface where you have a significant amount of diffuse reflection, which comes off in many different angles, one of the ways to then capture all of that energy and uh, account for that is to use an integrating sphere. So the integrating sphere would have a detector as part of it, and that integrating sphere and detector are a calibrated system. And that then could measure the, not only the, the uh, specular component that is uh, inside of that sphere bouncing, but you would also have the diffuse component. So this is a way in which you could then capture uh, all of the reflected signals and uh, yet again, have even more precise uh, measurement for your IQE. And in this case, 
again, similar to what I showed previously with the high and low uh, reflectance um, calibration uh, mirrors. In this case, we would use a diffuse low and a diffuse high reflectance standards to again calibrate the system prior to doing your um, the IQE uh, testing. So we can go to the next slide. So what I'm going to talk about here is this is a based on a turnkey system that we produce here at Newport. Uh, it's called a Quantix 300 or an IQE 200B. This is a patented system. And one of the components that makes this a patented system is the use of a beam splitter. And this beam splitter takes the same light coming through as we've previously discussed. So you have a light output coming uh, into this beam splitter. Uh, it's chopped, monochromatic, and the beam splitter will allow a percentage of the light to go through the beam splitter to a monitor detector. And the rest of the light was, is then uh, reflected downward to your device under test. The device under test will have a small component of reflected light coming back up to that beam splitter, where a portion of that will go through the beam splitter. And then the specular reflection detector will be measuring that. The key piece here is that this is all done so that there's no temporal changes in the light energy. If there was anything to, that changed in your light source, the monitor detector and the reflection detector would be measuring those two simultaneously in real time. So uh, as we had mentioned in the previous examples, you had to basically move the detector out of the way and then slide in your device under test. And so if anything changed between those two setups, you could have some error. This one, it's monitoring the light in a continuous way in real time. <clears throat> and that's one of the components of, of what makes this a patented system, as well as the type of detectors that we use. And Ken will get into this in a, in a more detailed uh, section later into this um, webinar. So I wanted to just point out that this is a turnkey off-the-shelf system. And another piece of this turnkey is not only the hardware, but the software, uh, and Ken will get into this as well. The software is a, it's a huge improvement in terms of being able to just uh, use a very easy, simple interface to do very complex measurements. We can go to the next slide, Ken. So um, for multi-junction cells, you may need that option to uh, light up that cell so that all of the um, cell structures are operational and working. And in that case, we do have a system that we use and sell. So pick the picture inside of the lower left circle is the hardware associated with that. So it's a fiber optic uh, uh, cables that can be mounted to the snout of, in this case, the Quantex system. You can then orient these, these lights to shine onto your device under test. Our um, light bias system also allows you to put in different filters. And those filters then can be tuned to whatever wavelengths you would like uh, shining onto your device under test. And uh, that this is just, a uh, again, a standard way that you can use this device for uh, multi-junction cells. Um, this lighting source can be used in other setups as well, including the one we first talked about, which is the tunable light source uh, methodology, you could also use this type of a system to uh, shine a light bias onto your test. Um, yes, we can go to the next slide, Ken. And All right, thanks, at this Dave. Point, Ken, you got it. Yep, thanks, Dave. Excellent job. Um, so, so far, Dave has shown you some methods of generating small bands of monochromatic light that's focused on a small portion of your sample under test to basically get the QE or spectral efficiency scan um, of your device. Um, there are other ways to characterize your cell. Um, this shows a kind of an overall cell efficiency and a key point of getting the spectral efficiency of the chemical makeup of your device is you can get the spectral mismatch factor. Now, I won't go too deep into detail. There are a variety of application and tech notes on our newport.com website that go into more detail. Uh, but the simplified method here is it allows you to do light adjustment to your light on your sample uh, for true one sun standard testing conditions to make sure you match those values correctly. Um, so IV testing, a very simple diagram in the upper right, uh, where light hits your sample, uh, produces a current, 
Um, and then whether that current or that cell is biased by a voltage, um, you can then generate an IV curve. Um, a very common instrument is a source meter or source measurement unit um, to then apply bias and measure those currents and voltages as it's being illuminated by a full spectrum of light compared to say the QE system where it's a small monochromatic band on a one small area, this would be full spectrum illumination uh, over the full device. Um, so these IV curves are generated as a uh, diagram in the center shows a typical use case where you have a reference cell with a known standard and known curve. Um, and then you do that scan to perform an IV uh, with a certified solar simulator. Um, you can get a variety of other characteristics from your total cell, uh, such as your short circuit current, open circuit voltage, fill factor, max power, et cetera, all generated from those curves and shown with some key examples in the bottom right. Um, so what this does is this will determine your overall cell efficiency. Um, and a very common use there is showing air mass 1.5, showing a typical use case for that. Again, that standard testing conditions uh, for your device. And I highlighted certified solar simulator because one of the needs and challenges is as you are illuminating your cell, you need to make sure it is considered a uh, standard solar simulator light. Um, there are a number of governing bodies that determine which characteristics are key to ensure that it is matching the sun's output with that solar simulator. Um, three key areas here that are certified. One is spectral match, um, shown in the upper left, which is saying that there is a proper radiance of power at each wavelength scan across that range for sol solar simulation. Uh, number two is uniformity of irradiance, which basically ensures there is an even distribution of light over your full test area, whether it be two inches up to 12 by 12 inches or greater, ensures that you're hitting a uniform level of intensity throughout the whole active area uh, of your cell. And then finally, temporal instability. Um, this ensures that there is minimizing time dependent effects as a variable uh, during your, during your uh, device under test. So how you can solve these needs and challenges um, is through a solar simulator. Um, here shows some details of a typical Xenon arc lamp based system, one that we provide here at Newport. Um, they have different uh, diagram features here that solve those challenges of a certified solar simulator. Uh, one is a spectral correction filter, which allows you to perform a radiance profile matching uh, to whatever needs you have. Um, again, a, a graph at the bottom left just shows some typical spectrums, uh, most commonly air mass 1.5G, um, but there are other applications such as space or overcast direct applications where you'll use a spectral correction filter to match your needs. An optical integrator and collimating lens are in system here in line the light path to ensure you produce homogeneous uniform light across your total working sample plane. And then finally, we include a highly regulated lamp power supply to ensure you minimize those time dependent effects and have an ensure stable intensity over time. Uh, another feature of solar simulators is electronic sh shutter. Um, this is ideal for when you wanna synchronize your data collection of your IV scans uh, for timed exposures, as well as limiting exposures to your sample. Depends on the chemical makeup of your device. Um, if you only wanna do small doses, you control it with electronic shutter. So the, the picture on the right here shows a typical use case where we'll use a, a known calibration cell um, with a known QE or spectral efficiency curve and IV characteristics. You'll perform a scan first, make sure you're at the proper one sun working plane uh, based on the spectral mismatch factor and power level. And then you will slide that out and put your device under test to perform those same curves, same performance to ensure you have proper IV characteristics under standard reporting conditions. Another way to consider for testing and validating the efficiency of your device is temperature effects. Um, so as you're performing the IV characteristics under a solar simulator, um, you may want to vary the temperature to reveal thermal effects on that device under test. Um, as you can see in the chart in the upper right, this shows a heating and cooling curve over time and how it affects uh, the open circuit voltage um, while it's being tested. This can derive temperature coefficients for that curve. Um, you can see the relative changes in efficiencies and other IV parameters while it's being temperature heated or cooled. And you can characterize hysteresis during temperature cycling, meaning as your device is heated and cooled, you may see different uh, parameters change at different same set point temperatures. Uh, again, another important characteristic of characterizing your device under real time effects. 
Um, so this can be temperature adjusted through a couple different ways. Um, as Dave has mentioned, the uh, common way is to use a temperature chuck to control the sample or device under test. Another common way is to place your entire sample and sample stage into an environmental chamber while you're illuminating uh, light to your cell and observe those temperature changes um, under those extreme use cases or potentially as an accelerated aging test. Um, and then you can see in the bottom right, um, the thermal effects on that open circuit voltage during successive IV, can, uh, IV scans as you increase temperature over time. Another optional way that we hear our customers want to uh, experience or observe their device under test is to use UV light as a way to either extreme use case, uh, say as extraterrestrial applications, or accelerated aging testing of a PV device or other such device under test. Um, using a solar simulator, you can use either unfiltered or ARAM0 in a lamp-based system, um, or you can get a dedicated UV emission source to irradiate your sample with that specific band of UV energy. Uh, solar simulator is key because that, again, that maintains uh, that uniform irradiance on sample to make sure that the total active area of your device has the same level of intensity uh, throughout the device. Uh, in terms of accelerated aging, um, you can achieve multi-sun irradiance conditions if you just focus on this UV portion of the spectrum. Uh, as an example for MKS, we have uh, solar UV systems that can provide up to eight solar constants in that UV band of range, or basically eight times the sun's power in that specific spectrum. So how a customer would do this is use a IV scan or a QE scan um, to see how the device behaves under normal conditions. And then on the, de the dependent level of UV exposure, they can retest those electrical parameters and efficiency degradations um, after exposure time. And the graph on the bottom right shows a typical UVA spectrum that we have from our MKS portfolio of products. All right, so we're going to go into the next poll, so I'll launch that now. And the question is, what IV range best describes your device under test requirements? So the first option is less than or equal to 1 amp and less than or equal to 20 volts. The next one is less than or equal to 1 amp greater than 20 volts. Less than or equal to 3 amps, less than or equal to 60 volts less than or equal to five amps, less than or equal to 40 volts, then less than or equal to 10 amps, and then less than or equal to three volts. So I'll give everyone a few moments to answer this. So this answer is rolling in. All right, and if you get your last answers in, I'll close it in a few seconds. All right, I'll close it, and then here are the results. So the first option had 29% less than or equal to one amp. The second option had 14%. The third one had 29%, as well as the fourth, 29%, and the last one actually had 0%. Thank you, everybody. Hand it back to you, Ken. So we're gonna conclude our webinar series, taking a product spotlight at the turnkey efficiency systems that Dave mentioned earlier in the presentation which is our Quantex 300 and IQE 200B systems. Um, these are fully integrated turnkey solutions that allow for simultaneous IQE and EQE measurements uh, for your lab uh, use. This includes all the components seen in the past slides in terms of the light source, your chopper, filter reel monochromator, your two persistent onboard detectors, as well as a variety of sample stage and sample reference detectors um, as a fully turnkey system that also comes with a pre-configured PC with software. Now, the main difference between these two systems is the wavelength scan range, which we'll go into more in a, a further slide, but depends on your wavelength of interest. Uh, you may choose either the IQE tuner B or the Quantex 300 for the wavelength scan range of interest for your device under test. As Dave mentioned, these are patented designs that offer a unique advantage for other solutions in the marketplace. Um, one is the simultaneous measurement in one scan. Uh, again, this reduces those uncertainties due to temporal effects of changing locations of your detectors and performing successive scans. And this overall increases your throughput of the device and lowers testing time uh, for multiple scans in your lab. Another patent feature is our silicon germanium bounce detector, 
Um, and this, again, reduces the need to switch your detector references during a full scan, which further reduces your uncertainties under test. Going a bit more into detail of what's included in our typical quantum efficiency packages. Um, so again, all the elements of the light path are there, as we've seen earlier, um, to set up the initial scan and, and data outputs. Um, this also includes those reference detectors and high and low reflectance standards. Um, those allow you to perform a one-time calibration on your spectral reflection and monitor detectors to ensure you have accurate results. Uh, this includes that chopper as well as that digital lock and amplifier, uh, pivotal for those AC measurements. This also includes the tip and tilt adjustable sample stage that has cooling and vacuum chuck capability. So you can hold your device and cool your device um, right off the bat with this turnkey system. And as mentioned, this comes with a pre-configured laptop with all the integrated software package pre-installed, the files ready to go, so you can start doing QE scans right out of the box. Going a bit more into the software side, here's a view of the Quantex software. It's an intuitive icon-based layout where you can see all the elements in path, light source, chopper, filter reel, all there in easy to understand icon-based systems. Uh, clicking on any one element will open up a separate control panel where you can uh, adjust ad additional features for here, the monochromator, where you can set the start and stop wavelength, step sizes, as well as the grading switchover points for full customization. Uh, and both the IQE 200B and Quantex 300 both come with the same software system. Just some additional features that's built into the Quantex software to further enable your tests and results. We have temperature monitoring built into that sample stage for real-time feedback. We allow you to perform that sample bias adjustment to your cylinder test, uh, plus or minus 10 volts. We have options for simple BNC or four wire measurement, terminal measurements uh, for higher accuracy in your measurement samples. We offer the independent DC and AC gain control uh, real time to that chopper and lock and amplifier elements, as well as ability to monitor that chop signal real time as you're performing your results. Okay, now we're gonna go a bit into the patents we have for this system. So as we mentioned, the Quantex uh, 300 and IQE Tuner B has two persistent onboard detectors. And what these are, it's our patented design. And then, as Dave mentioned, it captures the reflection, uh, the monitor, and your device under test all in one scan, which reduces those uncertainties due to the temporal changes in light paths. Again, as one temporal effect is seen on all three detectors, the software will be able to mitigate that to ensure highest degree of accuracy for, uh, for your scans. And again, uh, repeat, any sort of uh, uncertainties between separate scans. So this increases the overall repeatability and accuracy of your data collected and reduces your overall test time. And as mentioned, these are patented designs. If you go to our newport.com website, you can see more information on this and many of our other patents we have at uh, Newport MKS. And another patent here to mention is uh, the bounce detector, which is in the Quantex 300. Um, again, this design here you can see um, uses a summed silicon germanium detector, um, which offers continuous scanning over that full wavelength range without the need to change detectors. Again, further reducing uncertainties in those extended wavelength scans. As you can see here, uh, the incoming light from those bounce detectors um, hits the germanium sample first. That element gets reflected off and captures the silicon energy portion of that before going into a beam dump um, to ensure all light is captured and no additional stray light is introduced into your test. This again is a patent design. These are included on the Quantex 300 and more information is on our newport.com patent page. And to further set up your lab for success, we have a variety of accessories that you can order um, to fit your specific needs. That includes enclosure cover for your light tight experiments, um, temperature chiller and vacuum pumps to interact with your sample stage, a variety of probe kits to provide electrical contact to your cell, as well as that external light bias for those tandem and multi-junction cell testing. Another thing that with us at MKS is we have the ability to provide specials configurations. Um, we have a little variety of catalog products that can meet your needs, but if you see something that isn't within catalog, uh, reach out to our team. We can provide a variety of special configurations to match your specific application requirements. Um, a common use uh, or for specials is output orientations to say for our solar simulators, 
Um, you could do upwards for glove box applications. We also could do the sideways or horizontal emissions, uh, which is common into environmental chambers uh, for temperature testing. We can do full monochromator grading customization. So we have some standard turnkey monochromators and tunable light source systems. But if you want to have specific monochromators that have either increased scanning resolution over a small range or have extended scanning range over a wider wavelength range of interest, um, we can meet your needs with customized products. Again, we have tunable light sources that are turnkey as well to order, but if you need something custom from there as well for one package, we can create those systems as well, which include IR optimized versions, as well as quad grading monochromators. So if you need to have a variety of density scans or wider wavelength scan ranges, we have options to go to monochromators that allow four separate gradings to be selected for your wavelength interest of needs. And with MKS Newport, we have a variety of integrating spheres and caliber detectors for those diffuse measurements. Again, if you see something that isn't within our catalog, feel free to reach out to us to see if we can have a solution that would be customized to your needs. And that's it for our webinar. Now we're going to the open Q&A session, which I will hand it over to Joanna for questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Yes, we do have time for a few questions now before we close. Everyone, if you have not already, please go ahead and type your questions and comments into that webinar chat. All right, so let's see. This first question I have here is, can you use a solar simulator to perform QE measurements? Uh, while technically possible, it would be quite difficult. Um, to perform a QE measurement, you've got to have some way of um, filtering to a monochromatic light. So you could um, switch in individual bandpass filters into a monochromator um, to select that monochromatic light. Um, so that would be a bit cumbersome. With some of today's LED solar simulators, you may have the capability to individually select um, different wavelengths, but again, that wouldn't have as much resolution as uh, a grading or a prison-based um, monochromatic light selection. Great, thank you so much, Todd. All right, let's see. So this next person asked, how can you add light bias to an integrating sphere-based system? Yeah, um, in, our, in our systems, um, we have um, added a, just an additional port on the side that allows entrance of a, um, a fiber optic or a light guide um, from the, from the broadband light source typically that's angled so that it so that the all of that light hits um hits the sample um rather than just adding extra energy into the integrating sphere though you could in, just in, inject it into the integrating um into the integrating sphere it's just going to kind of raise your noise floor versus directing the light um, at your sample, which will, you know, absorb, well, most samples will absorb most of that light. Great, thank you so much. All right, let's see, this next person asked, what are the benefits of using a high resolution monochromator? High resolution monochromators in the name, um, they've got, um, they've got enhanced resolution, which, provides a narrower bandwidth or a, a smaller full width half max. Um, yeah, that's gonna give you better separation between adjacent spectral lines and then increased resolution enables you know, essentially a more detailed analysis of the device's response at specific wavelengths. Also usually coupled with a, a high resolution monochromator, you, you also, generally get an improved um, precision and accuracy, um, which will then allow the precise selection of a specific wavelength. And then you're um, just 
enhancing the accuracy of your quantum efficiency measurement. All right, great. Thank you so much. And everyone, that's all the questions we're going to do for now. But if we have not answered your question already, please look out for a reply later. If you do think of another question, you can let us know by emailing webinar at photonics.com. That's W-E-B-I-N-A-R at photonics.com. And just one final note, this whole session was recorded. It will be available on the Photonics Media website shortly, and you will receive a link to that recording by email. If you did miss part one of this series, that is also available on photonics.com. And finally, i just like to thank Ken, Dave, and Todd one last time for presenting today. That was wonderful, guys. And thank everyone here for, par for participating in this webinar. It was presented by MKS Newport and hosted by Photonics Media. So thank you, everybody, and have a nice day.